All right, so a good amount of you already know me. Um, some of you worked with me or just have known me for so long, and I'm sorry for that. I am. No, I'm just uh, anyways, uh, my name's Billy Carando. I have been developing software primarily in the Spring Java um, uh, domain for about 10 years now. And just to get a little bit of a background, because like one area I've been really becoming passionate about um, is unit testing and, and automated testing in general. Um, and isn't that a great name? I totally came up with this spring into better unit testing all by myself with no help from anybody else. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, so like I said, I've been developing software for about 10 years. Um, with my first company, I was there for about seven years and I decided really what I wanted to do was get into consulting because I worked with a really smart guy when I was there and he was a consultant for a long time. And I think a big reason why he was so good at his job is because he had a broader perspective on the industry rather than just working at one place for a long time. Because even if your place that you work at is really good, sometimes you can just kind of get into your head just the processes of what your company does and that can kind of narrow your view. Um, and so then within that area, I've been really interested in kind of figuring out like why are some companies successful with delivering software, you know, and why are some other companies aren't successful? Um, we hear about companies like Netflix, Facebook, Amazon, Google, like they can deliver software to production, like they're delivering it many times a day um, on very deli quick deliverance um, schedules and often with like very little um, manual intervention. And so how they are able to do that is through um, really good automated testing, unit testing, and then um, other types of testing, which I'll get a little bit into. But yeah, um, if you haven't read it, um, read the book, Continuous Delivery. Uh, even just kind of reading like just the first chapter is very illuminating. It's just kind of like, because they kind of cover like automated testing in there, and you kind of realize just how central this stuff is into making our jobs easier in you know, delivering quality software to production uh, more quickly. So, what is automated testing? Um, and so there, a good way, or a common way of sewing this is with a pyramid. And so kind of like pyramids, the bottom is more stable um, and there's a lot more of it. So at the bottom of it is unit tests. So yeah, these should be running very fast, there's gonna be a lot of them. A little bit above unit test um, is component integration testing. Now, I have a dotted line here as a acknowledgement because I had some conversations with some people in this room um, about this, and there's disagreement between us over if there's a real difference between component integration testing and unit testing. Um, and I'll get more into it, and actually uh, our, our friend, um, Josh Long, in his most recent book actually does give a good reason as to why this should probably be a, uh, a harder line, but I'll, I'll get to that. That'll be a little bit of a treat for later. Um, but it's important that I am right. So, Next up is system integration testing. This is definitely the much more traditional form of integration testing. This is when you're actually doing integration contract testing uh, between like different systems, like either a database or another service or a CAS or something like that. This is you know, a remote system from whatever code that you're actually testing. And beyond maybe contract testing, at least another um, use case I can think of with this would be like failure case testing, because this is something I personally experienced where at a previous client, I built a microservice, and of course it just worked perfectly uh, until it didn't. Um, we like it had to be restarted sometimes, and I later found out that the DBAs were bringing down the database for um, maintenance, and my data source wasn't throwing away their connections after um, they went bad. And anyways, the only way to kind of really properly test that use case is like actually connecting to the database, bringing it down, you know, doing some more connections, and then bringing it back up and seeing if you can connect again. So like I think that's also kind of falls under system integration testing. Um, and then finally, at the top of this pyramid, we have acceptance tests. Um, and these kind of tests are um, like the very high level, like Cucumber, BDD acceptance tests, where like the given wind in, in which you're maybe doing end-to-end -end tests across multiple systems. 
Um, and I guess really there's more kinds of testing, like performance testing, load testing, and then like maybe um, UI testing. Um, but some of that kind of gets a bit outside of the scope of what I'm at least talking about here. So um, this presentation, we're going to be primarily looking at the bottom two layers of this pyramid, unit testing and component integration testing. Um, so I kind of at least touched a little bit on the benefits of automated testing, but to kind of get, drill a little bit more into that, um, here are some other benefits. So verifying correctness, um, you write a method out, you write a class out, it's important to know does that um, class kind of meet the needs of your um, of what your business is wanting to do. So by having tests that say, you know, um, like we have like a name object and you know we have like within that name object like print out full name, um, like we can call print out full name and make sure that it takes in like you know that name object and properly prints it out. You know if we want to have like you know first name and last name or maybe we want last name comma first name um, if there's like a middle name in there you know we wanted to print that out but if it's not there we don't want it to fail because it's not there uh, but by having test right there you can actually validate that that is working and not only that you can kind of also then document how that should work um, that's another really great benefit to automated test is you kind of document the behavior system like how it's supposed to react to these different situations um, and not just necessarily you have to kind of look through the code to kind of figure that out. Um, and then I'll also just beyond just like the name of test cases themselves and stuff like that, um, there's um, also tools kind of like uh, Spring Rest Docs which can actually take your unit test and produce like real documentation from them. Uh, I won't be covering that too much and then also isn't there something with like Spock that can actually take your Spock test and print out documentation? I thought I remember reading that somewhere. I have not used it. Okay. But I do know, I think there's stuff with like with uh, Cucumber or with be, uh, behavior driven development and stuff like that. They can also kind of take out some of that information and produce some documentation as well. So that way, as you're writing your system, um, you have documentation, but beyond that, it's not just like an abstraction of like, here's a Word doc that kind of explains what the system is when I, you know, um, finished up coding it at the very end and has been updated in two years, like that documentation, because it's actually being run as test, should be pretty valid, um, if not totally valid. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of where how we can actually develop and push code to production faster, all these unit tests will be here to detect regressions. If you kind of go in and make a change and that changes a behavior or something, that's a, you know, that may break a unit test and then you just, you know, that should then, you know, stop that push to production until that unit test um, is fixed or whatever kind of automated test you have that um, was broken. So, all these great things about automated test, but why don't we test? I mean, who here has at least 10% code coverage? 20%, 30%, okay, 50, 60, 70, 80? Yeah, I mean, only a couple of hands. So, unit testing is, automated testing is so great, but yet we don't have um, high automated test coverage. So why is that? Um, so, a lot of the arguments I have seen, and a lot of the arguments even I have um, said myself, is it's time consuming. It just takes so long to take this like method and then write a test for it, because I have to find data, or I have to set up like all these expectations, or all this stuff. Um, or they can be difficult to maintain. So, like, I finally, you know, after hours, got these tests set up, but then, like, a week later, they fail. Or they fail for no reason. Or, you know, I know why they fail, but now I have to go find more test data because, like, it, this record was only good for a week, and it's actually a really narrow test case, so it's just really hard to find. Um, then, ultimately, this kind of comes back to, you know, people just make an argument not just you know management, but even developers. I hear that they just don't provide enough value. All the time it takes to write them, all the time it takes to maintain them. It's just not worth it. We need to get code out to production faster because like changes are happening all the time. Um, so I think a lot of that comes back to is that particularly with like unit testing, I think there's a lot of confusion as to what exactly is a unit test, um, and I've had this confusion for a long time myself. 
So let's look at this method. It's not terribly long. Raise your hand if you think this method can be unit tested. All right. Not, not many hands. So, huh? Okay. So, uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, this method actually cannot be unit tested. Um, so let's look at a test, you know, that some people might call a unit test written for this. And so it's like, throw, let's throw an exception if we can't find that customer. And kind of ignoring, having to go through like all the setup of having to write this test, you know, we're setting it up and then we're calling like service, create order, and we're saying like bad customer ID, and then um, if it doesn't throw an exception, you know, that should fail the test. Um, anyways, this isn't a unit test. And it's not a unit test because it's not being ran in isolation. Um, let's kind of look back at that. So, at kind of the very top of here, um, I guess it's still in isolation, but it's still a difficulty, is like we have validate items. So before we can do a test any other part of this method, we have to fulfill all the conditions that we look for in validate items. Whatever they might be, they have to be fulfilled before we can like test you know, how we're interacting with the customer service. And this is a difficulty then is, you know, we, we write a unit test that, you know, that does the validate items, um, and like if it fails, we know it fails, but then all the other maybe tests we may have written for this, if um, they may start failing because something in validate items um, changed. Um, but then really why this can't be unit tested though is with the customer payment, or like the rest that gets um, for the, both the customer and payment and then also the calling out to the database. Because these are, particularly because we're newing the rest template, we can't mock that out so now this test, any test to this code, depends upon external services. So in effect, they really become more integration tests. And what this means is they're going to be much slower to run. Um, you're going to have to go out and maybe get like data to like um, uh, create it because like now you're depending on these services that you're calling. So it's going to take much longer to write them. And then um, if that data changes, now your test is breaking, even though none of the code within the test is itself broken. Uh, this is something that took me a long time to really kind of understand and appreciate, because I just, because at previous places, like a lot of those um, complaints about like why we don't unit test, like I had them because like writing a test that covers this, this took forever. Um, and this maybe isn't like the best method just because it's not really doing a whole lot of business logic, but you can kind of imagine if like you have a bunch of if statements and stuff in there, um, like, you know, if it's a certain kind of customer, you're going to do this. Um, you can kind of imagine that um, if you're kind of then trying to go through all that, you're going to have to like find very specific uh, test cases that may sometimes be very um, hard to find. So, like I said, one of the key things is um, unit tests need to be ran in isolation. That keeps them very fast and also helps make them much easier to write. Um, so then, like, somebody like me goes and makes this presentation or talks about, like, continuous delivery to, like, management at your company, and then that management is kind of like, we need to start writing automated tests, and they start telling all the developers, hey, start writing tests, we need to get code coverage up and all that stuff, just because we have to make that number of like 80% coverage. Um, and so then developers start writing tests, and then, so like here we have a model object, and it's just a super simple with one field, and then they get our setter. And then they start writing tests like this, like order new, and then you know set the number, and then making sure if you call get on it, you know, that it equals that. And again, this isn't a unit test because we're not verifying any business behavior. All we're verifying here is can Java assign a variable or assign values to a field, and that, that doesn't tell us anything. Now, it can be valid to test getters and setters, but only if those getters and setters are actually like doing some sort of logic, like, you know, maybe you have like in that getter or in the setter, like verifying that, um, where you pass it in is a numeric. You know, at that point, it would become valid to you know test that because maybe some other developer goes in and like you know turns that off. And you want to know that you know somebody did that um, by covering that unit test by passing in like you know an A into that field. But otherwise, yeah, um, you want to be verifying some sort of business meaningful behavior 
when you're writing unit tests. Um, so kind of going back to that method earlier, um, so we've updated it, and so now we're making, instead of like uh, validate items being a um, private method, it's now in a separate class called item service. Instead of um, newing up REST template, we're making out um, calls to like customer service and find, create payment. And then also we have our, um, yeah, we have an order dial as well instead of making a direct call to database. And so what all this does is allow this um, stuff to be uh, mocked out. We're passing in like a dummy item service and a customer mock and a payment mock and all this stuff because like we're not actually trying to test you know, the behavior of validate items or the behavior of fine customer, we're gonna have separate unit tests that cover that behavior. Um, but, you know, we, all the unit tests that cover create order, so only be covering the code that's actually within this method and really nothing else. So, anyways, one final thing. Um, this is, I know I've probably done this a couple of times and I see this in a couple of times. Um, that's not a unit test, and this is also just not me, not just generally unit test, but not kind of any AMA test. So in here, um, we're testing um, order service kind of somewhat properly now, um, and we're inserting that if a customer, bad customer ID is passed in, it's not found, but then we're doing like another um, valid call to create service and then asserting it's not null. And so this is not a unit test because we're verifying multiple scenarios. And so this isn't a unit test because like how do you name like this kind of unit test? And then when this unit test fails, I mean other than going into it, like you just see like a little red mark, you're not gonna immediately know why it's failing. Um, even if you like you wrote out the test to include verify both bad customer and good order, um, when that fails, you're not gonna immediately know why that failed. That to just be broken up into two tests, every, um, every test case should be asserting only or verifying one scenario. And so yeah, this finally is, I mean, it's just pretty much the same unit test just with a single scenario, it's verifying. All right, so I kind of touched upon it, but um, what are some good ways to actually write code that's unit testable? Um, and one of the best so the principles I've found for that is solid principles. So how many people here know what solid is? Okay, a couple. So I will actually then have to go through this all. That's, that's great. Um, so solid principles is an acronym, obviously, and it stands for single responsibility, um, open closed, and sorry, one other quick thing. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything, feel free to give them at any point. We are not really specifically time constrained, so you know, just let me know if you have any questions and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, sorry, continuing on, so single responsibility, um, open closed, uh, Liskov substitution, interface segregation, and then dependency inversion. So what all this means, like I kind of um, roughly break these down to two groups of cohesion principles and then dependency abstraction principles. Um, and to kind of go more into that, so single responsibility, there should be only one reason for a class to change. Uh, so here we have a very generic sounding main service, uh, one service to rule them all. The methods in here, they have no real theme and they cover like multiple domains from order to customer to account. We have like create customer, find customer, update account, and so on. Um, so we're gonna be constantly in this main service, constantly making changes, like every, every code, um, like every business update, every code push, it's probably gonna have significant changes to this main service. Um, and then single responsibility, um, it also applies at the method level, so like this is going back again to the method um, I kind of sold with the example of what is and there isn't a unit test, but you know, this is breaking single responsibility because particularly here, like we're making a call out to the database um, or we're setting up a connection to call out to like a service. Um, and it's, you know, well, I guess it's maybe working stuff even later on, but it's just trying to do a bunch of different things um, within it. Um, but kind of by pulling all this out, this method now is only doing a single thing of creating an order. Um, which makes it much easier to test, as we kind of showed earlier. 
So then interface segregation, um, better to have many client-specific interfaces than a single general purpose interface. And again, kind of a similar, just main DAO. Um, and you know, this is like inserting, you know, it's working with orders and customers and payments. Um, and if you wanted to write a mock implementation of the method, which isn't super relevant anymore because there's really great tools like Makito that you don't really even have to bother with like mocking out four classes, but let's say you did, because um, there's still, sometimes that happens, you would still have to kind of like work to implement all these methods or they'll just be kind of hanging out there in your implementation with like to do's or just empty um, bodies within them. So it's better to have multiple um, interfaces because there's fewer methods means it's easier to mock and it's also much cleaner. You know, now you have order DAO, okay, well that's where the order stuff is. Customer DAO, that's where the customer stuff is. Um, it's not just piling it all into one single interface or kind of just randomly breaking them up because we can't have more than like 12 methods in a single interface or something like that. Uh, so then now into the dependency abstraction principles. Um, so like we are trying to test person service and then person service directly implements or depends upon person DAO, like it news it up within the class. And then of course person DAO depends upon the database. So now this test person service, as we kind of maybe talked about earlier with that create order um, uh, method, it's not only testing person service, but it's testing person DAO and then the database. Um, and then if we were to take this further, like we have like a test person controller, which then depends upon person service directly, which then depends upon person DAO, which then depends upon the database. So, you know, you can kind of see this, how this goes farther and farther. Now, you know, any test written in the person controller also depend upon everything below it. And, you know, it's easy where a lot of our, you know, classes or a lot of our um, applications that we write may have much longer stacks to where, you know, testing that top level, the testing that controller, you're gonna be testing, you know, who knows how much, and any little change in there could then break that test. So how do we resolve this? With dependency abstraction principles, of course. Um, and so again, to kind of go a little bit deeper, deeper into them, um, open for extension, close for modification, so the behavior of a class can be extended, but the extended behavior should not modify the code of the original class. Um, list of substitution, the behavior code should not be, should not change if a different subtype is used. And then dependency inversion, high level classes should not depend upon low level classes, both should depend upon abstraction. So what, how does do these, be, um, what does this all mean? How does that apply to resolve the problem we were just looking at? So again, maybe has this code look like in production, we'd have person service, but then it would depend upon the interface person DAO and then person DAO impl would implement the interface. So now person service doesn't know directly about person DAO impl. Um, that's being passed in through like Spring um, as a uh, dependency, um, but they both depend upon person DAO. So if we wanted to unit test this code, we could just pass in a mock person DAO and then test person service. And because we're following things like list cost substitution, the fact that we're using a mock person DAO instead of the actual implementation shouldn't affect person service because it's unaware of it. And then we can apply that up higher, so where again, if we're testing person controller and it has some reference to person service, we can pass in mock person service instead. Uh, and that way, again, you know, now our unit tests are only affecting the actual test class that we're trying to test. It's not, um, you know, getting that ever extending chain of dependencies or things we're testing. Um, a few additional design considerations. Um, so do not use field injection. Um, Josh Long uh, and other members at the Pivotal team explain it best. Um, uh, using a field injection for one means all test dependencies now depend on string, the spring container, which is gonna also cause your test to run um, slower. So without having to do setting up the spring container, you know, I have like 100 unit tests in the uh, microservice I recently wrote, and they all complete in about five seconds, and that's because like each unit test you know, takes less than a tenth of a second to pass, but if you do this, it's gonna maybe be a second, um, and that can quickly add up time when you start getting to the hundreds of unit tests to where you're not gonna be running that test suite as often. Um, 
But yeah, sorry, Josh Long and other Pivotal team members have said it best. Um, field injection causes a unit test to break every time. Um, so instead, use constructor injection. Um, it, who here is using Spring 4.3 or later? So a few of you. So as of Spring 4.3, um, if you just have a single constructor in a class, Spring will auto detect that for auto wiring. So no longer we have to put auto wire at the top of your constructor. And to me, that it's a pretty strong indication like Pivotal is saying use constructor injection. You know, we're going to make it a little bit easier to use constructor injection because it's a good thing to do. Um, it's, you know, kind of then hinting you along the, um, the good path. Um, maybe for some reason one of your dependencies is optional. Uh, that can happen sometimes. Um, in which case, use setter injection. And yeah, just put auto-wired on top of like a setter and spring roll. Um, inject that for you. Um, for making things a little bit easier to test, so like maybe a test you're writing um, needs to use the name class, but like you really don't care what's within that name object, it's kind of nice just to have a um, default constructor you can call just to kind of new up a name object without having to like maybe have to put a bunch of nulls um, into like the constructor fields. Um, also, Again, name object is a really good example because like you're going to be using strings for all that um, and then it's going to be confusing as to maybe what order they would be in. So like let's say you have first name, last name, middle name, suffix, and title. If you were to write that actually out, you know, that would be like title, first name, middle name, last name, and suffix. But by importance, you know, probably last name would go first. So when you're looking at the constructor of five string objects, it's going to be really confusing to know like which one will go first and not only that, that order could be changed because like some developer liked a different order and that's not going to cause like a compilation issue. Um, so in that case it can be very useful to use builders and you probably used these before. Um, I know if you like to use like Spring Security, um, Spring Security a lot for the configuration they kind of use the builder pattern. And that's just where like you can call like first name and then first name that method like it sets that value for first name and then returns itself um, the, the name builder class and you just kind of like chain that along and this can be useful for issues like what I'm talking about because now you know okay I'm passing in first name here last name here and then if like certain fields like last name can't be null you can have like that validation we call build on it that actually then returns um, the object that you're building. Um, so, uh, test driven developments. Um, I, for a long time, like, I, I still don't follow this as nearly as well as I should, um, but it's a very powerful way. So, is everybody here somewhat familiar with test driven development? Um, I'll go the, through this then pretty quickly, but test driven development works by first you write a failing unit test. Um, so, like, let's say we're doing something with, like the name object, like, print out full name, um, well first before we even really write that we may write the method signature but then write out a unit test that you know looks for like for a full name object and so when we run it it's going to fail because we haven't implemented it yet. So we write the final um, unit test which is going to be read, then we implement the feature and then you run the test until it, or you keep implementing the code until the test passes green. And then as you, new, as you add new features, you add new test cases, and like a big part of test-driven development is you only write the minimum amount of code to make the test pass and then no more, and then you just kind of keep adding on to that. Um, and but what's so great about this is, is then you're going to have all these tests written out, so that way if something changes, you're going to be detecting regressions, kind of like I mentioned earlier from the benefits of writing automated tests. And because all these tests are here, you can start refactoring your code with confidence. Um, and so yeah, I mean just kind of a visualization of how this all works out, just failing test, implement, um, get the test to pass, and then you start the process over again. Uh, would anybody see, like to see a demo of test different development in action or, um, okay. So I'll guess, <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people I know kind of a familiar, familiarity with it, but um, we're kind of going to go on then to component integration testing. Um, 
So, so yeah, what is component integration testing? So unit testing, that is testing your axle. Like this is where I think the difference lies. It's like unit testing is testing your actual application code, the code that you've actually physically written yourself. Um, dependency testing, um, with a couple of exceptions in there, it's t uh, more about testing the dependent library code, like how you interact with it, so that way if changes happen there, um, you, you know about them and you can also upgrade with confidence. So kind of where this comes from is a lot, um, like a lot of places I've worked at, like we start using Spring, um, building with Spring, uh, Spring Boot or something, but then like the version of the library that we start this project on is a version we stick with because like we don't know what's gonna happen if we upgrade to the next version, even if it's just like a patch version. Um, you know, changes could be there and that could break our code. Um, to me, like a lot of where this comes in is, of course, I'm sorry everybody heard about the Equifax hack. Um, and they're trying to blame struts for their problems. But, huh? Oh, oh, sorry, gotcha. Um, but, so yeah, they're trying to blame um, struts for the problem, but actually struts fixed the critical um, issue that uh, the hackers exploited to hack into Equifax's um, code um, two months before that exploit happened, or at least two months before they did. But really, I don't think that would have mattered anyways, because I would bet almost any amount of money that um, Equifax is probably many versions behind the most recent version of um, Struts, and that's probably because they're too afraid to upgrade it, because they have no idea um, what sort of changes you know, will happen if they upgrade to a more um, recent version of, um, of Struts. And so this is where um, component integration testing comes in by testing how your code interacts with the, um, your, the dependent libraries, you can um, upgrade much more quickly with, and with confidence. Another portion of component integration testing would be like testing cross-cutting concerns. Um, like a lot of times I like to use aspects to do like logging. So um, have like my RESTful endpoints and like I just wanna know like okay, what's all the variables being passed into and then what's the response coming out? Instead of like mainly going into each of those controller methods, um, I can write an aspect and tell it to look for um, request mapping or get mapping or anything like that. And then I can have a whole class or multiple classes if need needed dedicated to properly handling um, like printing out uh, all the different variables and like, you know, even like the endpoint and stuff like that. And it's just also much easier uh, or much cleaner because um, if you're going to be cop, you know, if you're doing this just copy and pasting code, you're going to only want to have like maybe two lines of code in there because otherwise like your method's going to become too big. But if it's all in one area, um, you're going to feel much better or you're going to be um, more minimal to having maybe more advanced logging that can actually maybe more properly print out like your like if you're getting JSON and it's like a post like oh I'm going to actually print out JSON instead of just like the two string for that object, um, but yeah so that's the goals of um, component integration testing, um, testing cross kind of concerns like aspects or security, um, and then with this we're also then um, because we know how our code interacts with these underlying dependencies. Um, uh, we have confidence to continue to upgrade to the most recent versions of whatever code. And then also one thing that's really nice, it's gonna make your developers much happier because no longer are you gonna be, you know, whole major versions or multiple minor versions behind whatever the latest stuff is out there and all your developers are like, oh man, wouldn't it be so great if you're on Spring Boot 1.5 to be able to, you know, use some of the cool features there or it'd be so cool if we're on Spring 4.3 so we can you no know, longer have to annotate our constructors with auto-wired um, because you have how your code's interacting with those th libraries, you can upgrade and then know that that upgrade isn't gonna cause any regressions because you're actually testing that behavior. Um, so anyways, on to how I am right and everybody else is wrong that this is a separate thing. Uh, I would highly suggest reading um, Josh Long and Kenny Bassani's new book, 
cloud native Java. Um, I haven't gone all the way through it yet, but it has some really good information in there. And one part of it is on testing. And um, so a lot of these tests um, would be kind of like interacting with like how are you using like maybe like spring data or how are you using spring MVC to handle your endpoints. And to do that, you would kind of have to spin up the spring container. And that's one way of um, differentiating between unit tests and these kind of tests is because you're actually having to spin up the spring container. So, ha. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I just thought that was kind of funny when I read that, but also I think that also may be better explained, though that doesn't totally cover some stuff because there are some things like um, I'm writing tests to cover, and I'll, I'll kind of show some of it here in a moment, um, to cover like how I'm marshalling and unmarshalling Jackson, in which case I'm not actually spinning up a container, but I can still consider that component integration testing because I'm really testing like, you know, does Jackson properly honor um, all those annotations and stuff. I'm not really truly testing like my model. I'm testing like how does Jackson do that. So let's take some looks at some um, component tests and integration tests. Um, but does anybody have any questions or disagreements or thoughts on what I've said so far? All right. Um, yeah. And so there, there, I don't think there is a objective metric. Code coverage is useful because like there's no way you can say like you have 10% code coverage, but I've definitely covered every meaningful business case. So in a certain respect, like, you know, I, th I think, you know, maybe 80% is like a, a decent enough number to where if you're kind of below that, it's gonna be hard to make the argument that you're actually properly covering the code coverage, that you're gonna be confident that if you push the code out there, there's nothing going to break. As far as like ensuring, um, kind of like to what your question of like making sure we're actually covering like all the important business stuff, there isn't. I, I would say probably the best way of doing that is like, does your developer feel entirely confident that if it is only automated test between you and going to production, like you commit code, it's gonna start unit tests and then maybe integration tests and maybe something like that, and it goes out to production. If they feel confident in only having that really being their barriers between um, the you know code on the machine and production, then you know I, I would say that that's the way you do it. But if they're not confident, they're like oh whoa hold on, like I need you know QA to check my code, then um, they're probably not. But yeah, code coverage will never cover um, everything. In fact, a great example in a service I wrote um, with you guys at American Century was um, I was testing, like, uh, so what I was writing was a service that talked to a content management system, a CMS. And it would take in some metadata and a file and then send it along. And in all the tests I had written, I just had expected a um, file with a single, a single word file name, like you know, test.pdf or something. But how the users were actually using it, they were sending file names with spaces in it. Um, and that caused an actual issue. So even though I had you know, code coverage and everything, I just never expected that as an issue. Um, so I had to go in and write a test to fix that. So you, know, you can't have 80% test coverage, it doesn't, or even 100%. Um, and it could all be extremely quality test, uh, but unless you know every possible way your user's gonna interact with it, you know, there's just no perfect system. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, you know, it's always gonna be a judgment call. It's gonna depend upon the developers actually making the committed effort that, you know, we don't want to rely upon QA to test our code. I wanna write these automated tests to make sure they're covered, uh, and it's just, it's just going to be 
training um, and culture and just to actually accomplish that. Um, and this, the metrics and stuff like that and code coverage is kind of this there to say, hey, you're not at 80% or 90% or whatever X percent you want, you need to at least get to this level. Um, it's just at least, yeah, one of the easier ways to know. Um, yep. Mm. So, yeah. 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 No. And actually, yeah. So right now, um, again, kind of like the the servers I was talking about, it's at like just over eighty percent, but like almost all of the missing code coverage is is in the generated equals method of a couple of objects that are, have like you know a bunch of fields within them. And even though like I'm using like the equals method, like I don't have like all the you know opposite um, um, like there's a lot of ifs in there, and so like I don't have like, every if covered, but it's generated by Eclipse, so like it's kind of silly to actually cover that unit. So yeah, but at least what Dan is saying is, um, who's here heard of Lombok? So yeah, most people. But for those who haven't, yeah, Lombok is a way of like putting annotations. Um, on your model classes, like you said, like at data, and you can even put like like an annotation like um, constructor no args, constructor all args equals to string, and so on. So that way, there and then the code actually then compiles at compile time, and because like Eclipse and stuff can read those annotations, like it knows those um, uh, methods are there. Or I guess it's actually because it compiles the code behind the scenes, and it knows that's how it knows it. They're there. Uh, but that's not going to show up on code coverage then that you're missing those. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, you're absolutely right there. And, but like I think a lot of code coverage, I think, at least the ones I see typically kind of take that in consideration. So like let's say you have like an if statement, like it's going to consider like did you cover like all the different ways of true false within that if statement. But like some of that also it's just like it kind of again kind of comes back to developers is like, like are you then, like you can write, you can do like 100% code coverage, but then if you assert nothing within your test, like it doesn't know that. So like it's also important like writing good asserts and stuff, but. Yeah, you're right that there is like tools and stuff that tell you cyclonic complexity or also tell you like, okay, you're testing like the true for this if statement, but not the false. Uh, any other questions or comments or? Uh, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, so and then. Okay, so how do you know if somebody code reviewed your code to make sure it has test coverage? Well, so that's where you don't hold them to amount to branch code for the code review. Okay, how do you know somebody actually did a code review and not just said, oh, I trust Frank, so I'm going to merge them? No, I, I and like I said, I I don't disagree. It's just I I am a big believer in automation. So I agree that just because you have a hundred percent code coverage, that doesn't prove that you know those codes or those tests mean anything. But it's impossible to say I have ten percent test coverage and trust me, you know this covers every possible important business thing. So it's only there just to say that. If you're falling below like 80% or something, or whatever you percentage you want, that means you're you're not probably adding enough unit tests as you're writing code. Yeah, and, and I'm not going to mm -hmm. go through the facts, but I do think you have to have some baseline. 
Yeah. My point goes back to the original question, mm -hmm. which was about the metrics around it. Yeah. And I just, from a developer perspective, it, it's meaningless. You need to mm -hmm. know those important little ways that you have some metrics that a manager gives them without actually doing any work, right? And your process, yeah. depending on the environment you're in, but most enterprise shops don't allow sensitive persons to remain on those applications. Because mm -hmm. you're Yeah. Or are they actually testing things? And, and I hate, it, it, it kind of sounds cynical, but I, I don't like when we try to put metrics around everything but the why I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And so then that, what that drives is the developer, right? Test for the public. Right. Get that number. Yeah. Exactly. So the public and that's why I would rather we actually focus on oh, good mm -hmm. tests. Yeah. I think most of us understand that testing is an afterthought for a lot of people, and it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And testing has a lot of value. Yeah. It does. Then how do we communicate that from a developer to a manager, and from a manager mm -hmm. to a developer, what is important? And I think it's really the quality that is the most important. Well, it could, yeah. I mean, you could make two projects that both have the same source driver, but the quality of them can be here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't, I'm not able to say, based on the show driver, this is what my manager asked for, that I may be able to say the quality of the project that is getting those pieces of action is, is better than it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, I, I absolutely um, agree with everything. Like I said, I, I could get to 100% test coverage and not have, you know, those tests mean anything. But it can be good just because, and the ultimate, like I said, I kind of mentioned when I was answering Jeremy's question earlier, um, the ultimate way to know if you're writing quality tests is, is that developer confident that if they were to commit that code, with it going to production without any other person manually intervening? And if they're not confident, then the obviously, you know, and like I said, you know, and that's also going to come with experience for that developer because, you know, some developers, you know, I write perfect code, but not everybody's me. So it doesn't need to be actually unit tested. But, um, no, not sorry, yeah, not just unit test, but yeah, a whole suite, kind of like that, that pyramid I showed you earlier of like this, the, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, and that's what, and that's what I'm kind of also more, more just generally about automated testing when I kind of say that. So yeah, yeah, definitely not just unit test. You definitely want to make sure, oh, can I still call out to customer service or can I still call to the database? That's why I've so. into the, the dilemma where we don't have time to do both. Mm -hmm. Allows the virtualization because I know it's a big stretch in the platform and they're Sure. So I guess how come you don't think you have time for both? I'm just. Yeah, I, cause, I mean, no, that, I'm, I'm trying to call you, because like, I know that's, that's why I never write, wrote unit tests a whole lot, or automated tests in general, is because like, I don't have time, and you don't have time, because, and maybe this isn't your case at all, but like, you're dealing with like a bug or something in production because somebody accidentally put something out that they didn't realize that, you know, if you had automated test coverage for that. Really, when you want to build a model, you can build an analysis. Yeah. That's really what you, the bottom right question is, what question really drives it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah.
and I think also you have a lot better fidelity with unit tests because with like an integration test, you know, it may be very difficult to get down to like, like a couple of if statements within a method. And, and the, yeah, well that, um, but then yeah, it just may also be very difficult or very time consuming to find out how to get to like these if statements or this specific condition within a class or a method or wherever. Um, because maybe that test data, you know, or that kind of data is conditions very hard to create. Uh, and then, like I say, yeah, speed is also a big one. Um, but. No, I, I do not, um, and that's one thing is, and that kind of goes back to like my opening monologue of kind of like trying to figure out why um, um, te or why some companies are successful versus unsuccessful when it comes to delivering software, and it's a big cultural thing. There is a really fantastic video by Jez Humble that um, this he from like a presentation he gave like back in like late September. Um, titled, Continuous Delivery is Great, but it won't work here. And he kind of systematically goes through like all the common arguments as to why continuous delivery won't work, you know, for me, for wherever your company is, and explains how it would. Um, and it's something that like I think every, like literally every person that at least touches IT, which really probably would be every person in an organization, should watch, or at least certain, definitely the people that are involved in the delivery of, um, software to be watched, just to kind of watch it and re-watch it to kind of understand what he's talking about and then probably re-continuous delivery. Um, because yeah, a lot of organizations don't appreciate the importance of automated testing. Go ahead. Or, well, I was just, you know, and, and I've, I've seen that. And, and this is what my question The video I just mentioned or just? I, I've seen similar things. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I wouldn't agree because if you don't have tests, I don't think you would ever feel confident just put, I mean, even if you could push new code out quickly, you could be breaking so significantly that, you know, like, what if you're writing data to the database wrong? You know, that's, that's a pretty severe issue. I, I guess I could kind of see that, but I... I would I would say code is the ultimate truth of what you're doing. You know, it's what actual where the you know tread hits the pavement. So I would put more because just just what we were talking about earlier with code coverage, you can totally fake that code coverage, and so you can totally fake those metrics to kind of say we're doing great, but you know you're. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So one thing I did want to touch on earlier um, to kind of about testing and like paying it now or paying it later and how Brian says you pay it much more later. Um, and so I'm sure many people have kind of seen that thing, like that chart of um, at every level where you miss to catch a bug, like it becomes like an order of magnitude more expensive to fix it. And sometimes I think it, actually ends up looking way too narrowly. Like you just think about it within just the context of that bug. But I think really the real reason why it becomes an order of magnitude more expensive is because you lose more and more confidence in um, like on in a code that you're actually committing. So then you broadly have to spend more and more time, develop more and more process before you can push to production. And that ultimately kind of slows down um, you know, how quickly you can move to production then because you have to have like a bunch of testers in there and you have to have like a thousand managers sign off saying yes, you know, and like it, you know, it's all theater really because nobody actually really checked anything. Um, I mean, QA probably checked something, but like none of those managers did. 
Uh, but ultimately, that really kind of slows down how quickly you can deliver. You know, now it's like you know going to production like every three months and stuff like that. Um, I think that's where a lot of the cost comes in, and then also just not in that ability to like update your libraries and dependencies, and then maybe eventually getting hacked because you're like a major version or many minor versions behind whatever the latest library. Um, you have out there. So sometimes you kind of need to just think about that broader perspective of how, you know, how this, doing this stuff can allow your organization to um, deliver software to production faster and with greater confidence. But yeah, and, uh, and that's what I said, it's, it, it has, it, it starts with buying, you know, like DevOps and CI, CD, I mean, it's, it's culture. It is absolutely culture um, until people are like, until people really begin to understand how so much of like those poor processes and stuff like that stands in the way of like that's where like all almost all the frustrations of their job come from, um, you know they're not going to get that buy-in. I'm like, oh no, this is the actual answer. It's kind of like one of those things. Like I just kind of semi realized, like, oh wow, this is like the reason why you know developing software can sometimes be so frustrating. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree. Culture and buy-in is important until people really understand why writing quality unit tests and you know high levels of unit tests is important. You know, it's never going to work. Um, so, if people have questions or stuff, I mean, this, that was some great conversation. Um, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also different types of testing that can help give you more assurance. Mm -hmm. So has anyone done mutation testing or heard of mutation testing? What it does is it actually randomly changes the code uh, intelligently that you're actually testing to make sure it breaks the test. And if it doesn't break the test, then yeah. it basically gives you some feedback and says, hey, you need to write a test for this. And That's good. Thanks. Yeah, I haven't even, I haven't heard about that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you run into to some degree still is like the other settings and stuff like that. Like, is that really helping you keep it? Yeah. I mean, you need that really for a generated ID entry, sure the ID generated correctly. Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I guess that is kind of to your question, Frank, earlier about mutation testing plus code coverage actually would begin to answer, you know, provide that valuable metric that, you know, you have 100% code coverage, but then it's mutation things going in there and changing stuff and it's never breaking, then that tells you that, you know, so that's actually a really great way of actually, because like I said, I, I'm kind of like from, you know, learning so much about continuous delivery, I, I have, I'm a big believer in automation and metrics, and that's a way of actually then validating those metrics, you know, at least in code coverage, is providing real value. Yeah, and I think the code coverage also provides value more mm -hmm. for yourself versus management. Yeah. Because you can use it to basically say, hey, did I get everything mm -hmm. or not? And then when you look at the code coverage, you say, oh, that's a get or setter, I don't care about it. Yeah. Or, whoa, look at all that business logic I missed. I better get a test for that. Yeah. And so going back to the reviews, like when you do the reviews, it's nice. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I do kind of want to show also here, though, um, I'm a big also believer in kind of really kind of getting into automated testing in that, like, you're going to have, like, you're, you're going to have kind of like just in that pyramid, there's like multiple layers of testing, and then also just making sure each of those different layers are actually testing something differently. 
So like I was talking about, and just because this is like all demonstration, I don't actually have unit tests around it, but I actually just did this today um, with uh, at, uh, my client at American Sensory, um, is making sure like each of those layers are actually, you know, testing something different. You're not like retesting the same thing over and over. So here I'm kind of just giving an example of testing, making sure that this logging aspect I set up um, is actually properly weaving um, through um, the areas of the, the methods I wanted to um, cover. And so pretty much for here, I'm just testing to make sure that, hey, if I pass a successful request through, does like the, um, does the, the before method where it kind of prints out like maybe like all the arguments and then the successful um, after method in which like I just say like, hey, it's exiting this method and this is a response I'm returning, does it hit those in, in that regard? You know, I'm just kind of test, you know, I'm not checking to see if like it prints out like all the, this, these different um, log statements. I'm just testing, you know, just a couple, like it's actually, you know, entering the different um, in, uh, enter method and exit method. And so like here, I'm also checking to see like, okay, like a endpoint throws an exception, you know, am I, um, this, is it going into that exception um, handling um, aspect? So like here I have like after throwing, um, you know, handling that exception and printing it out. And then finally here, like I'm just saying like, okay, I just need to make sure that it's actually also hitting all, or it's actually covering all the different endpoints. So like, and, um, and then so as far as like making sure like, um, like let's say like this returns like a null or something. I think actually the raise to string will probably actually handle null, but let's say it didn't, or I just want to make sure, like I would cover in unit tests, you know, that would be separate from this, um, kind of like that level of granularity, because that way, um, if like I'm trying to test that all in here, it's just gonna make this like test class really explode and kind of difficult to follow. Um, or if I just kind of retest it both in both places, it's just gonna increase that maintenance cost, so maybe I make some sort of change to that aspect, and then now I have to update a bunch of different tests. So that's also a way of um, not only increasing maybe like your test coverage, but also kind of keeping that maintenance cost down so that way when a test breaks, it's because it's breaking because of exactly what you're testing for. It's not breaking because of like some side effect reason. Um, and it's like, you know, and like the purpose of this test is purely testing does like the aspect reading and the, does that stuff work? It's not testing, you know, is I'm at, am I printing out like the, our giving like quality information in that logging aspect. Um, but that's also just like another really, um, I think important point when writing these tests is to make sure, you know, each of these tests, each of these test classes have a purpose and their purpose is distinct from other test classes. That kind of, you know, like I said, it keeps the maintenance costs down, keeps the time down. Um, and when, you know, tests start failing, it's not like a random reason why. Um, any other questions or thoughts or, yeah. And like I said, yeah, for here, um, yeah, like here I'm just kind of like testing um, JSON serial serializing, um, serialization. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, like even though I was kind of putting together some of these tests, you know, like it kind of pointed out issues of like, um, I wasn't like building like JSON formatting. Um, like going in, uh, if you pass in like a date format like this, uh, J Jackson can automatically read it, but if you're printing it back out, like you actually have to tell it to like print in a certain way, otherwise it'll just print as a long from, you know, mill milliseconds from e uh, epoch, um, so. Uh, this one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are you aware for like the test customer using Garfield, instead of doing a try and then doing a straight up and checking the exception like uh -huh. that, that there's an annotation or an attribute that like Oh yeah, expected exception. Yeah. Huh? Sorry? Expect, 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 yeah. That cleans up the test case a lot. 
Yeah, no, that's right. You know, I, I, I remember seeing that, but I just haven't really used it a whole lot. But yeah, that would actually be a better way of sewing this than, um, than doing like the tri cats. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but like, I mean, if you do end up doing it this way, like this is just important because um, if you didn't like have this here um, and like an exception wasn't thrown, like this test would still succeed because by default all test cases succeed. It doesn't actually have to wait for an assert to be successful to be to sew green. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just kind of explaining why, if you were doing it this way or something like this, uh, or maybe for some reason you don't want to do that, um, like it's important to kind of have like this little fill, you know, here, or maybe are within the catch saying like exception should have been thrown or something like that. Um, yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, which is cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing. Um, yeah, I love, I think I have some of it here in this code somewhere. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's actually in this. Um, assert J is like way better than the deep. I, I'm kind of surprised. I wish they would have done that in JUnit 5. Um, kind of going with like their search. Because like the thing I love most about, there's two things I love most about assert J. One, that it all starts with assert that versus a bunch of different assert methods because that's just kind of like, real, like I have like my code or my IDE to like automatically organize my imports. And so like I'm like, oh, and do a cert not null, and then I had to go up and like update my imports and like that. That's so annoying. With this, it's just a cert um, that, and then from there you can kind of do your uh, assertions, and it also reads out um, much better. I don't have good examples here, but you can do like, you know, a cert is equal to, or a cert is null, or cert that, and a bunch of other stuff like that. You can also like add messages, though. I think you can actually do that in JUnit. Um, and then, but it also has like some really nice things like this extracting. Um, so like I have like a list of logging events. I'm just saying like extract the message out of that. Um, and then you can just do like does it contain um, all of these, um, all of these uh, values within it. Um, so it has like a lot of really nice stuff like that. Yeah, I, I use the search A all the time and it would highly um, recommend that. And also like another thing, I always found like particularly with like assert equals, like it's always kind of flipped from what I've expected because it's, it's the what you're checking first versus the expected next and I always think it's like the other way around. Or I always forget. So I'm, yeah, I, I'm glad I'm not the only one that always gets that mixed up. So like that's another thing. It's like extremely clear that assert that, you know, this is what you're testing and then against this expected value. That's just... Assert J, yeah. That's, it's actually managed by the print thing you just parent as a uh, summary. <laughs> but it's, yeah. on the, it's on the notes for sure. Yeah. I think, it, I think I started managing it in the form of Purdue stuff. Mm -hmm. Because it was, I'm assuming it's all upgraded for Purdue and five years ago. So well, you don't need, it's not dependent on the Purdue and five. five yeah. Uh, oh, it doesn't depend on Purdue. Yeah, it doesn't, uh -huh. it doesn't require the exception. And I think that's why they didn't actually integrate it into uh, JUnit is because it wasn't so much integrating. I just thought they would have taken on like the notation of like, oh, we can start with a cert that and then do that later. Because that's a lot of work. Is why they didn't do that. That makes sense. I can see that being a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but and also like, who here uses or knows about Makito? Um, okay, most everybody. Because yeah, Makito is like I used to hate mocking. Like I used like JMock, and that was horrible. Um, but Makito, you know, like, uh, I guess everybody uses it here, so they already know, but it's so easy to use, and it's also very fluent, what it's um, being said. Until what? Until you get a board button that goes outside the 
Oh, and also that does remind me because actually earlier in my slide deck, I also had like um, avoiding static for like methods and something like that. Like you have like a bunch of static uh, because like you can't mock that out. But actually, of uh, Makito 2.0, they can actually now mock out um, static and final methods. You just have to add like a property um, within your like your test code. Yeah, I, I've heard, like, I haven't used Power Mock. I've heard, like, some people don't like it as much, or... Yeah, the reason is because they have to basically uh, all the testing tools that they integrate with mm -hmm. and then have to get extension points. So okay. So when you update, you have to have the right version of Power Mock, oh. which you kind of end up running into with a lot of libraries anyway, but yeah. Power Mock is pretty controlled for that problem. Yeah. But yeah, anyways, at least with like, yeah, Makito 2.0, which is that going to be part of Spring Boot 2? Because right now they're on 1.x. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think no. they've updated it yet. Okay. Is my best guess, but. Gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah. Just one quick question. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about the security Oh, are you talking like within the test itself, like this? Yeah. That's okay. So to be clear, when I'm talking about field of an injection, I'm purely talking within like yeah, the business code. You're right in saying don't ever do field level injection. Yeah, and and, I just, and that, thank you. And like that's that's what I'm clarifying is like that's purely for business code within tests like this. It's perfectly okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh. Yeah. I, it, yeah. But are you talking about you can still inject them that way just because you put like mocks into the spring container? Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Reflect. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, exactly. Don't. Do it, don't. don't. The, the other thing, are you J, uh, Java 8? Yes. Uh huh. You can actually get method reference there as opposed to typing in the. Oh. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. No, I didn't know. But, uh, but you have to be on the right version of the script base for that. Okay. I, I, I'd imagine I am because I. I can't. I can never remember the mapping of which version goes to which base, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I know more about Java 9 than Java 8 because, like, I've only recently started using Java 8, like, as a, at, a, at work. Um, any other um, questions or thoughts or? So what's the differences between uh, data five and I mean, how are all our systems named? Um, so I, do you, I don't know. I haven't been following JUnit five quite enough yet. Like I do know, like the one the one change I can think of offhand is like they have like a new display name annotation, which is also UTF-8 compliant, so you can put like emojis and stuff in here, which could be good for like, which, you know, it's funny, like at first, yeah, you know, you know, it sounds ridiculous at first, but then actually Sam Brannon, um, that's like the, the JUnit 5 team lead, he actually made a really good argument for it. So like, let's say you do localization. So you can put like the, the different flags there, or maybe there's, for some reason, like there's this like really important unit test that like if this test, I mean, really again, every test if it fails, like you know, it should be a, like a, a it should stop it. But you can maybe put like a little like the little um, siren symbol like next to it, like this is really important, you know, like don't let it go to production. Or maybe it's like an integration test, which you have that allowance of it fails and something. But uh, there's actually some usefulness to like the emoji. It's not just you know. Uh, Putting a poop emoji in there. <laughs> yeah. I have a problem with the comment on the smartest. Yeah. I've been playing with the JU5 and it, it is a different paradigm. Yeah. Like it's not the two big JU accounts. Yeah. You have to bring in which engine you want, if you want to use legacy engines, get legacy tests, you can. Yeah. Like the run list is gone. Mm -hmm. You now extend things. So it, yeah. it is a Yeah. I'm assuming Rob's probably much older, a lot older. 
Yeah, yeah. Do you want to kind of go maybe a bit more? Um, I guess one thing, um, I've used like some links for this, but this guy, Petrie Kynuclin, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, but he, you can sign up for like a newsletter, a weekly newsletter, and it's just a good way of, because it's kind of like hard to like, how did you figure all this stuff out? You know, it's, it takes time, and sometimes it's kind of getting like, like this is a great one for like getting some like weekly newsletters. Um, specifically on testing. I mean, there's plenty of other great places out there if we get some newsletters like Spring Tips. Um, but for specifically testing, you, you kind of put stuff out there every week, kind of like here's some you know cool links and stuff, and that can be helpful to kind of start learning more about this area. Um, and I'll try to get this slide deck out there and everything. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Or everybody's going to go back to their office and immediately start unit testing all their code and automated testing and component integration testing and cool all right so thank you very much